Thank you. Um, well, let me first of all explain something about the geology of the Sanganogen layer. Um, we're situated in the Sanganogen layer, just to put you in roughly where we are, 80 miles west northwest of Bristol, uh, 130 kilometers if you prefer. Now, <laughs> this is a piece of the Carmarthenshire sheet of the uh, geological survey. Uh, Carmarthen itself is here. Uh, this is the River Towie and the River Tav here. And they're running into Carmarthen Bay, which is on the north side of the Bristol Channel. Now, why would a person who worked on Jurassic Ammonites venture into land like this? Because what you have over here, the base of the old red sandstone, according to the map here, sitting on the Arendic series, the Ordovician. Well, years ago, I had a very uh, keen extramural group who kept coming back for more, and in the end said they wanted to do more fieldwork, so I suggested mapping, and then I had to find a place for them to map. So um, I've decided no point in going anywhere that's been mapped regularly, but it had to be within an hour's drive of Swansea, where I was then based. Uh, and I picked this area, uh, and the reason I picked this area was because there was a good variety of rocks. There were arenic rocks, which are in blue here, or two various shades of green, with igneous rocks at the base of the arenic succession, overlying old red sandstone. So I thought, well, we've got a good lithological variety here. It's a good place to go. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we first of all discovered that the arenic succession here was the wrong way up, according to the geological survey. And then we started to find other things wrong. Well, perhaps I should explain, if you look at this map, the date on it is 1968. But when you read the small print around the margin of the map, you find the only part that was remapped in 1968 was the southeastern corner here. The, the rest, the whole rest of this map goes back to 1908. Anyway, we started mapping along here, mapping the unconformed tea and getting into the Arenic rocks in which we discovered the geological survey had got the succession the wrong way up. And then we found this uh, at the base of the Arenic, there's these bright green rocks here, which are um, conglomerates. And underneath these, there were scrappy exposures of shale in this area here. And I thought, well, these shales are probably traumatic. So I made a, got a special excavation with my extramural group, and we dug a hole in the corner of a field, and we pulled out a very rich traumatic fauna. Well, this set me thinking. I thought, well, if these rocks here are traumatic, these uh, igneous rocks just down the road here, rhyolites and andesites according to the geological survey, these cannot possibly be uh, arenic because they seem to be lying underneath the traumatic. And since there are no extensive igneous rocks known in the Anglo-Welsh Cambrian, I thought they have to be pre-Cambrian. And then I remembered there's a little quarry just about there which had got some strange green-looking sediments in it. So we decided to have a look at that, at that quarry in a little more detail. Here we are, close up of the area. Here's the igneous rocks, and the little quarry we went into was just here. Now, at the time, we couldn't map the area in much detail at all because there was thick forestry over the area. But some years later, the forestry was uh, developed and new roads cut through it, and I realized then we could good chance of mapping the area in some detail. So I, I called in Richard Bevins uh, to come and help me map this because with his igneous expertise, he was the right sort of person here. And we established that we're, there are two uh, formations. First of all, we've got uh, rhyolites at the bottom of the succession overlain by volcanic clastic sediments, which we call the um, Castle Kogan rhyolite member here, succeeded by the Coidcochian volcanic clastic member. Uh, and there are some intrusions in this. There are basalt flows in the upper uh, succession. And we think there's probably no break between the two, uh, though the succession has got some faults through it. And here's the old red sandstone to the south. Now, one of the other things we've found since is that uh, a lot of this area around here is Cambrian. And in fact, if we just quickly go back to this map, the only bits of Arenig on the map are in fact over here. All this area here, 
all around there, apart from the bright green bits, all that area there is Cambrian and traumatic. Completely missed by the Geological Survey. So these are the fossils we started pulling out of the quarry. And pretty clearly, we'd got an Ediacaran fauna. So a lot of them were these rather peculiar discs, not showing a lot of detail. And it soon became very clear that what we'd got were Aspidella-type fossils. Now, the Galing et al. published in 2000 in Paleontology a paper on Aspidella. And what they claimed was that you have these small Aspidella discs, which are invaginated, and that they range through into these larger discs, the uh, morphogenus sprigia, or the more uh, flattened, or the more elevated discs, which are called ediacaria. And these are preserved typically as hyperreliefs. In other words, they are, the, the, they are convex downwards. So the uh, planar upward surface and they are convex beneath. So all of these planar upward surface. Now, they s maintained that the mode of life of these was, uh, they were in fact bulb-shaped structures which were in the sediment and they supported a stalk on which was a frond. Now, the only problem with this interpretation is nobody's ever found a frond, despite there being many thousands of specimens of Aspidella known. So this to me has always seemed a bit of a problem. Why should they all disappear? Now, some of these surfaces we have here are absolutely plastered with these aspidellas. These largest specimens here are about seven millimeters across. And if you do calculation on what's how, what the density is, you work out something like 2,500 to 3,000 individuals per meter squared, which is exactly the same sort of density that you get in uh, Newfoundland. So very dense on some of these bedding planes. Some of them are a lot sharper. This is uh, eight millimeters in diameter and quite a lot of detail there. And some of them have got strong radial ribbing. Now, one of the questions is, is this just an artifact of preservation? Because you do not find this radial marking like this on any of the larger discs. And some of these, like this one here and this one here, each of these, pretty well exactly a centimetre across, have got a raised margin. So that's another question. G Galing et al. said that there was a complete science transition. Although the small things were vastly outnumbered the larger ones, they had a complete size transition. This is different at Thangunag. We do not find anything between 12 millimetres in diameter and 25 millimetres in diameter. There's a complete disjunct relationship between the large and the small discs. Uh, here's another small disc. This one's 11 millimetres in diameter. Again, you see very strong radial partitions and the raised margin around the outside. And here's a specimen, again, similar sort of thing, but this is interesting because it shows and supports the Galing et al. model in that this one is crushed and you can imagine this was a bulb-like structure that has been distorted by crushing. So that's just one specimen that we've got that shows that type of uh, distortion. Now here's an interesting specimen and it gives a lie to the idea that these things are all hyperreliefs because we've got both hyperreliefs and epireliefs next to each other. So that's a feature that doesn't seem to be very common in these ediacaran assemblages. Here, let's have a look now at some of the larger form, forms. These are the ediacaria type things. Uh, this is uh, 40 millimeters in diameter. You see there is very slight radial <coughs> marking, but nothing very marked at all. And a series of concentric uh, bands around the organism. Here's another one uh, with marking visible round the outside here. Again, 40 millimetres in diameter. And this one, uh, 
just under 40 millimetres in diameter, clearly the same species as the ones I've just shown you. Now, when I first photographed this specimen, I thought I didn't focus that very well. In fact, this is perfectly focused. This actually, I think, is an algal mat, which is masking the surface of that disc. Disc is uh, 38 millimetres in diameter, uh, is being masked by an algal mat over it. And that, therefore, is the <coughs> upper surface. So we have here uh, an epirelief form. Sometimes you find that specimens have interfered with each other's growth, as here. This is one of the very large forms, or the largest forms we've got. This one is 110 millimetres in diameter. Uh, again, suspicion possibly of an algal mat there. There's something over the surface there. And the largest specimen of all we have, if complete, that would be 140 millimetres in diameter. Uh, but these raised... Uh, Concentric ringing, uh, like the Ediacaria type forms. Flatter type forms, these are the Sprigia type, where there's very little relief. And here we have two discs. The smaller one is just over 25 millimetres, the other one 40 millimetres. And here a succession, again, the smallest one is 25 millimetres in diameter. And again here. Here's an example where Sprigia type forms have interfered with growth one with another. So small one growing here has been stopped growing presumably by this larger specimen here. Now some of these structures, these small disks, and here we're looking at uh, small disks, seem to 10 millimetres in diameter. There is something coming out of that from the centre of it but it isn't on a stalk. It looks like some sort of fan-shaped structure emanating from the centre of the disc. And this is a feature that occurs in one or two specimens only. There is something coming out from the centre of that one. And then in this one, again, you can see some structure on this side of the animal coming out from the centre of the disc. So it looks as though some of these do have structures, but they're not the typical fronds. And just to whip through now one or two of the other fossils we've got here, here's Hemolora, originally described as a tentacular disc, but now known from many localities in the world. We have trace fossils, various sorts. Uh, we have some um, segmented traces, looped traces, uh, a, another segmented form. Uh, these are forms which are known from the White Sea, Yovalet, Yellow Vicness, known from White Sea and very many other Ediacaran forms, and Paleopascaicness, again, very common Ediacaran fossil. The one fossil, trace fossil, we've got that seems unique to this area is this specimen. It's 10 millimetres long, uh, with seems to be a branching trace fossil. Well, to conclude, how old are these fossils? Well, the comparison seems to be where the Fermus formation of Newfoundland, where the Aspilla formation came from. That's estimated normally to be about 558 five, million years old. We have one date from our area. We have, in the Rhyolites, we've got a date of 567. So there may be a break between that and the fossils. We're not sure at all. Unfortunately, although we have provided the uh, geological survey with uh, zircon bearing uh, rocks from just underneath the um, Ediacaran quarry. They've been sitting on for 10 years and we cannot persuade them to spend the time to get a date. It's a pity because it would be one of the most accurate Ediacaran dates from anywhere in the world. <laughs>